Hey friends, this is your buddy Carl for another daily Bible reading. And yes, this is September the 8th. We have finished now in the Old Covenant reading, Old Testament. You know, a lot of books. You know, we're up through Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon as well. Now we're on to the prophets. Prophet Isaiah. Gosh, a major prophet. Very powerful stuff. So we're just going to read and dig in. And let's pick it up here with Isaiah chapter 1 and chapter 2. Yeah, wow, powerful stuff. All right, the sins of Israel and Judah. So prophet Isaiah was sent to try to get him to turn. Here we go. These are the visions that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem he saw these visions during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah. Listen, O heavens, pay attention, earth. This is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. Even an ox knows its owner, and a donkey recognizes its master's care, but Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. Oh, what a sinful nation they are, loaded down with a burden of guilt. They are evil people, corrupt children who have rejected the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Why do you continue to invite punishment? Must you rebel forever? Your head is injured and your heart is sick. You are battered from head to foot, covered with bruises, welts, and infected wounds without any soothing ointments or bandages. Your country lies in ruins, and your towns are burned. Foreigners plundered your fields before your eyes and destroy everything they see. Beautiful Jerusalem stands abandoned like a watchman's shelter in a vineyard, like a lean-to lean in a cucumber field after the harvest, like a helpless city under siege. If the Lord of heaven's armies had not spared a few of us, we would have been wiped out like Sodom, destroyed like Gomorrah. Listen to the Lord, you leaders of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, people of Gomorrah. What makes you think I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord? I am sick of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened cattle. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and lambs and goats when you come to worship me. Who asked you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgust me. As for your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath and your special days for fasting, they are all sinful and false. Okay, so the Lord is letting them have it for just turning faith into religion. Basically, they're, it's everything's become so perverted with Judah. So this is sad. He says, I want no more of your pious meetings. Verse 14, I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual feast. They are a burden to me. I cannot stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice help the oppressed, defend the cause of orphans, fight for the rights of widows. People, 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 wow, wow, wow. This is prophetic of that time, and it also speaks, when we read the prophets, church, a lot of times we need to take it to heart for the church, for the people of God, and we have to weigh that, not with condemnation, but not to forget what righteousness is, what living with integrity is, with living with true faith, producing the fruit of good works is do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of orphans, and fight for the rights of widows. So it's more than the politics. Let me apply that even to the obvious things of social unrest today. The church should always be on the forefront of, de of demanding righteousness and justice in a nation not discrediting leaders, not hurting anyone, not calling for the police to be defunded, but for calling for justice to be righteous and true, and things need to legislatively be changed to honor the cause of the oppressed and to make sure justice is truly upheld, 
Nobody wants injustices. Nobody wants perverted justice, especially the church. And so we stand in our nation, in America, the obvious things we're dealing with. Not in, again, not in violence or rioting, but to stand and de to demand of our leaders to do right and the church to stand with all peoples, black people, brown people, every color, every tribe, every even unbelievers. As Christians, we should be ones to see to it that the, the laws of the land speak with the righteousness and integrity of the God-made country that we believe the United States is. If we're really built on Judeo-Christian principles, which I believe we are, then even as a conservative, however you perceive yourself, that doesn't matter. It's just like, yes, absolutely. And without having it be distorted by dark forces. And that's a whole other thing, right? And I'll just say this. People say, well, Pastor Carl, Leon, what do you think about the social unrest? Are you standing with Black Lives Matter? I go, I have black friends. I have people of color of, of a lot of different nationalities in the U.S. worked with them. They're friends. We have some in the church. Yes, and we love that. And we stand for justice in the country. So... On that level, we do, but the be the black. Unfortunately, the Black Lives Movement, that's become a political organization, has become corrupt, with all kinds of perversion. So, no, we don't stand with that organization politically. But the church definitely stands in the gap, and I've worked with and we pray with other leaders of other cultures in the Nashville region and say, we stand with you. What do we need to do? Who do we speak to at legislative things? How do we vote? How do we think? How do we go after our representatives? Yes, with calling out for these things to happen. Okay, so that's the prophet Isaiah. And that's how we apply things like that in our day. We don't let it get slanted. We don't let it get compromised to think, well, I guess we just need to do that because it's politically correct. No, we have to be, we have to be righteously correct. True justice correct. No perversions of justice. No perversion of the cause. And I'll say this for the record because I have friends of color that are frustrated that the politics of the day perverts the ability of the cause to be truly won. Although we're seeing breakthroughs and we're seeing things happen, all of these this upheaval in America, man, it's, it's definitely this. So we don't stand back and we don't cower back and say, I, I just can't do nothing. I just can't say anything. No, we say that. We say this. It's like, yes, black lives matter. Brown lives matter. People that have been oppressed, yes. But we will not have political organizations pervert the righteousness of the true righteous cause that that needs to shine forth. I hope you understand that. And any of my friends of color that listen, I hope they feel encouraged with that. So... Yeah, people say, what do you think? <laughs> I'll throw this in there, too. What do you think about white privilege and all that? Like, I don't, I don't follow the politics of that. I don't feel guilt for my color either. I don't want people to judge me for my color and who I am as much as I know they don't want to be judged for their color as a group, as a collective group. And if people can't see that that's a perversion of the cause that the enemy, the true enemy of us, wants to tear people apart. That's the work of the devil. That's not righteousness that exalts a nation that we read about in scripture. But Christians that have fortitude have to say, this is how it does. This is how it's got to work. This is how we want to see it done. And we will not have perversion of, of political causes robbing the potential of what could change a nation. Yeah, this America has done well. We, over time, slowly things have changed. I believe we're seeing an acceleration. All the more reason that I believe the spiritual battle is in place to, to keep that from truly happening. And the church needs to stand together to see that that doesn't get stolen in this time. And that's strong. And that's what I got from reading. <laughs> the prophet is speaking, folks. It's biblical. Prophecy speaks of even to us in these days. So take heart, be courageous, stand for righteousness, and don't let anybody force you to lose ground or to compromise true justice, true righteousness that will exalt the nation. Yes, and amen. There you go. 
Verse 18, Isaiah 1. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you will be devoured by the sword of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. Verse 21. See how Jerusalem, once so faithful, has become a prostitute. Once the home of justice and righteousness, she is now filled with murderers. Even Jerusalem in that time, folks, look at there. Ah, once like pure silver, you have become like worthless slag. Once so pure, you are now like watered down wine. Your leaders are rebels, the companions of thieves. All of them love bribes and demand payoffs, but they refuse to defend the cause of orphans or fight for the rights of widows. Oh, people, may us as Christians especially, uh, you know, help the poor, the orphan, the widow, those in need. Again, not having organizations or even individuals manipulate, but to truly find a way to truly help those people. And it's challenging finding the right organizations to help those people and demand our leaders to do that. One of the things I don't like, even as a Christian, as a pastor, as a citizen, is that the, the corruption of government on every front, both parties, makes it so difficult. There's so much like payback and pay me this, or, you know, well, if you want to get this done, then I also have to have, to have this. No, ah, gosh, and we have to pray for our leaders and pray for our nation that that the fear of God uh, falls on the governments. I'm talking about D.C. and all the states and so on and so forth, right down through cities and towns. People are called, that we get still the right to vote and put leaders in place, but they have to have the fear of God and call for righteousness with nothing under the table, nothing sneaky, no lying, cheating, stealing. And people say, Carl, you're a dreamer. Yes, I am, and I believe it can be done. And the Christians, need to, we need to demand it. And if you're a believer and you're called to it, run for office, run for the school board. Our voices need to be heard. We just don't hang out in our four walls. Yes, we preach the gospel. We live the gospel. Jesus is not political, but the way we believe affects how we govern. And that is true. Jesus loves all people. He's calling for everyone to be born again, to be delivered, to be set free from all unrighteousness and to come under him. Yeah. All right. There you go. Okay, let's move on. Wow. Verse 24, Therefore the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies, the mighty one of Israel, says, I will take revenge on my enemies and pay back my foes. I will raise my fist against you. I will melt you down and skim off your slag. I will remove all your impurities. Then I will give you good judges again and wise counselors like you used to have. Yes, Lord, give us good judges and wise counsel as your people and as a nation. Then Jerusalem will again be called the home of justice and the faithful city. Zion will be restored by justice. Those who repent will be revived by justice and righteousness. But rebels and sinners will be completely destroyed, and those who desert the Lord will be consumed. You will be ashamed of your idol worship in groves of sacred oaks. You will blush because you worshipped in gardens dedicated to idols. You will be like a great tree with withered leaves, like a garden without water. The strongest among you, among you will disappear like straw. Their evil deeds will be the spark that sets it on fire. They and their evil works will burn up together, and no one will be able to put out the fire. Woo, people. Okay, for September 8th, we're going to get through chapter 2 as well. So this is the Lord's future reign. This is about more pointing to the church, right? Even Isaiah, we can see it coming. Much of this points to Jesus and the church coming, the church age that comes. Chapter 2, this is a vision that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. Many people feel that this is the church of Jesus Christ. Think bigger. It's not just a particular place. The mountain of the Lord's house? Well, where is the Lord's house? The Lord's house is his body. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. So the Lord's house is his people. 
right? You get that? Wow, thank you, Lord. It will be raised above other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways, and he will, we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation, nor even train for war anymore. Well, that is a much farther future reign because we're still in a world still consumed with conflicts and war and nations pitted against each other. There will come a time when the Lord fulfills all of this totally. Verse 5, Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. For the Lord has rejected his people, the descendants of Jacob, because they have filled their land with practices from the east and with sorcerers, as the Philistines do. They have made alliances with pagans. Israel is full of silver and gold. There's no end to its treasures. Their land is full of war horses. There is no end to its chariots. Their land is full of idols. The people worship things they have made with their own hands. So now they will be humbled and all will be brought low. Do not forgive them. Crawl into caves in the rocks. Hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. Human pride will be brought down and human arrogance will be humbled. Only the Lord will be exalted on that day of judgment. For the Lord of heaven's armies has a day of reckoning. He will punish the proud and mighty and bring down everything that is exalted he will cut down the tall cedars of Lebanon and all the mighty oaks of Bashan. He will level all the high mountains and all the lofty hills. He will break down every high tower and every fortified wall. He will destroy all the great trading ships and every magnificent vessel. Human pride will be humbled and human arrogance will be brought down. Only the Lord will be exalted on that day of judgment Idols will completely disappear. When the Lord rises to shake the earth, his enemies will crawl into holes in the ground. They will hide in caves in the rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. On that day of judgment, they will abandon the gold and silver idols they made for themselves to worship. They will leave their gods to the rodents and the bats while they crawl away into caverns and hide among the jagged rocks and the cliffs. They will try to escape the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty as he rises to shake the earth. Don't put your trust in mere humans. They are as frail as breath. What good are they? Wow, Lord. There you go, the prophet Isaiah warning the people of Judah. And... In future generations, God will come and deal with mankind in certain ways, and I don't have all that figured out. Nobody does. For the now, what we do is to love and love God passionately and love people the same way and to follow hard after Jesus. That's what we are called to fulfill. All right, that's it for September 8th for the prophet Isaiah. Let's see what Psalm, Psalm 52 today, folks. Okay, September 8th, Psalm 52. King David, the theme here is God will judge the evildoer. <laughs> well, there you go. That's what we're seeing in the prophet Isaiah. Our anger must not block our confidence in God's ability to defeat evil. Psalm 52, for the choir director, a psalm of King David regarding the time that Doeg, the Edomite, said to Saul, David has gone to see Ahimelech. Verse 1, why do you boast about your crimes, great warrior? Don't you realize God's justice continues forever? All day long you plot destruction. Your tongue cuts like a sharp razor. You're an expert at telling lies. You love evil more than good and lies more than truth. You love to destroy others with your words, you liar. But God will strike you down once and for all. He will pull you from your home and uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see it and be amazed. They will laugh and say, Look what happens to mighty warriors who do not trust in God. 
They trust their wealth instead and grow more and more bold in their wickedness. But I am like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. I will always trust in God's unfailing love. I will praise you forever, O God, for what you have done. I will trust in your good name in the presence of your faithful people. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you, King David. So I think he's referencing being chased by Saul, right? And calling against those that stand against him. But he's describing how he positions himself in the Lord. I am like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. That's fantastic. All right, may we do the same. Thriving in the Lord. All right, September 8th, the Proverbs is Proverbs 22, verses 26 and 27. Don't agree to guarantee another person's debt or put up security for someone else. Amen, amen, and amen. This is an eternal truth. Don't go in debt for somebody else. Don't promise, don't co-sign. Even amongst family members, that's risky business. Unless you're free to say, I don't care if I ever get paid back, I'm just helping my family. Hmm? I've seen more families hurt from this, and I won't tell you my own personal story. Not with my family, but don't agree to guarantee another person's debt or put up security for someone else. If you can't pay it, even your bed will be snatched from under you. Yeah, I've done that. I've tried to, I thought I was helping somebody, assisting them in, in some money things, and it came back to bite me. <laughs> anyway, yes, I've forgiven and moved on, and God redeemed it. But boy, it was a hard lesson to learn. Okay, so here we go. That's the proverb. Today's. Sorry, uh, I don't want to miss my mark here. I did that. Yeah. Okay, today's New Covenant for September 8th, New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul is defending his authority. Now I, Paul, appeal to you with gentleness and kindness of Christ. Though I realize you think I am a timid, I am timid in person and bold only when I write from afar. Well, I'm begging you now so that when I come, I won't have to be bold with those who think we act from human motives. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons here, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And after you have become fully obedient, we will punish everyone who remains disobedient. Wow, Paul's lowering the boom here. Verse 7, look at the obvious facts. Those who say they belong to Christ must recognize that we belong to Christ as much as they do. I may seem to be boasting too much about the authority given to us by the Lord, but our authority builds you up. It doesn't tear you down, so I will not be ashamed of using my authority. I am not trying to frighten you by my letters, for some say Paul's letters are demanding and forceful. <laughs> How about that? But in person, he's weak, and his speeches are worthless. Oh, interesting. Hmm. That's an interesting comparison. They were misunderstanding what he was trying to accomplish, see? That wasn't necessarily true. Paul always spoke boldly when speaking publicly. All right, verse 11. Those people should realize that our actions when we arrive in person will be as forceful as what we say in our letters from far away. Oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are, but they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. Hmm. We will not boast about things done outside our area of authority. We will boast only about what has happened within the boundaries of the work God has given us, which includes our working with you. We are not reaching beyond these boundaries when we claim authority over you, as if we had never visited you, for we were the first to travel all the way to Corinth with the good news of Christ. Nor do we boast and claim credit for the work someone else has done. Instead, we hope that your faith will grow so that the boundaries of our work among you will be extended. Then we will be able to go and preach the good news in other places far beyond you where no one, where no one else is working. 
then there will be no question of our boasting about work done in someone else's territory. As the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. When people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is for the Lord to commend them. And folks, that's Paul's encouragements to the Corinthians. But we always weigh these things even for the modern church and ask Holy Spirit, Lord, where does that apply to how we're navigating nowadays? That's important. All right, we bless you all in the daily reading. That's it for September 8th, and we will see you tomorrow with another daily Bible reading. Bye-bye.